A super common task in analyzing data is to measure summary statistics for different groups of items. We might want to know the average age for Republicans versus Democrats. Perhaps we want to know whether men have higher salaries than women. Maybe we want to determine how salaries vary by level of education. Each of these questions requires us to take a set of data, subset the data by a group, and then calculate a value for each group. So how do we do this in R? One approach might be to extract the data corresponding to Republicans from the data set and then calculate the average age. We could then repeat for the Democrats. Let's say there was a third party we were interested in. Well, we'd repeat the process, but for the third party. But what if there's a fourth party? A fifth? Well, that would get tedious very quickly. There's an alternative approach to, available to us using the dplyr package, which is also part of the tidyverse. The dplyr approach is super powerful. We can use the group by function to group our data by a categorical variable like political party. We can then use the summarize function to calculate summary statistics for each value of the categorical variable. This approach is super adaptable to any changes in the data. I don't need to know all of the political parties to carry out this process, which is part of what it makes it so powerful. Furthermore, we can apply this general approach to a wide array of questions. Now, if you've forgotten what we've been trying to do over the past 17 episodes, I don't blame you. <laughs> a lot of the work in a data analysis pipeline is getting data into a format that allows us to answer our questions. You might recall that bacterial genomes tend to have more than one copy of the 16S RNA gene. So this raises a few questions. First, how many copies of the gene do bacterial genomes typically have? Second, if there's multiple copies of the gene in a genome, are they identical to each other or are there differences? Finally, if we find a sequence in one genome, how often might it, uh, fi we find it in another genome? These questions are important to the ongoing discussion in microbial ecology because there's a push to using distinct sequences or amplicon sequence variants, also called ASVs, as surrogates for bacterial taxa rather than using clusters of related sequences. Let's think about the data as we currently have it in our data frame. We have a column that contains an identifier for each 16S RNA gene sequence that is for the ASV that was found in the RRNDB. We have a second column that contains an identifier for each genome in that database. Finally, we have a column that indicates the number of times each ASV was found in each genome. But how does this relate back to the examples I started with at the beginning of this episode? How is this similar to grouping people by political party? Well, if I group the data by genome, I could count the number of 16S genes in each genome. I could also count the number of ASVs in each genome. Alternatively, if I group the data by ASV, I could count the number of genomes where each ASV was found. We're really going to leverage this approach in future episodes. Today, I'll be talking about using full-length sequences, but I could also use a subregion of the gene and see how these counts change, and I might even do that for the V4 region in this episode. But instead of looking at the genome level, I could also look at the species, genus, or any higher taxonomic level as well. But we'll look at how those counts vary by taxonomic level in a future episode. For today's episode, we'll use the group by and summarize functions and a few other helper functions to do an exploratory data analysis of the sensitivity and specificity of ASVs to each genome. Even if you're only watching this video to learn more about R and don't have a clue what a 16S RNA gene is, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of today's episode. Please take the time to follow along on your computer. If you haven't been following along but would like to, welcome. Please check out the blog post that accompanies this video where you'll find instructions on catching up, reference notes, and links to supplemental material. The link to the blog post for today's video is below in the notes. Excellent. So by now we should be old pros at getting into our project uh, directory. Uh, again, we've got the alias RRN that moves us there. Um, and we see that we're on the master branch. It's green. All systems are good. So today's work is going to be largely exploratory. So I'm not going to create an issue. But something I want to remind you is that we have a directory in our project root called exploratory. And if we look in exploratory, we'll see that all that's there is a readme file that's also blank. Um, and so that readme file is there so that we can kind of keep this under version control if we choose to commit anything. I'm going to go ahead and open up um, the Schloss RRN analysis rproj file. This will then launch RStudio for us, as we saw uh, in the last episode. Um, great. This brings us into our R session. I'm going to create a new R script. 
and I'm going to save this as um, uh, let me expand that because I want to save this not in code but I'm going to put it into exploratory and I'm going to save it as 2020-09-09. So I'm going to post this on the 10th, um, uh, but for me today, it's the 9th, and I will do uh, 0909.r. Uh, and so I'll save this as an R script with today's date. I uh, probably should give it something a little bit more descriptive than just the date. Maybe what I'll put here... Um, is something like genome sends spec. So genome sensitivity specificity dot R and go ahead and save that there. I'm going to start this with a library tidyverse and go ahead and load the tidyverse. So we've got that in good shape. What I'm going to work with is that count underscore tibble file that we had from the last episode. So I'll call that FL for full length data. And we'll do read underscore uh, TSV. And that was in data v19 forward slash. Um, where did I call that? Um, yeah, R R N D B uh, count underscore tibble. Um, and so if we run that, uh, we see that this loaded very well. I could, in my read TSV, go ahead and specify that ASV is a call character, genome is a call character, and count is call double. But again, for this type of kind of rough uh, exploratory analysis, I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, these aren't warning messages, but um, I, I like to, to be explicit with read TSV and telling it what these different things represent. So again, if we look at FL, our data frame, we see that our first column is uh, called ASV. And so this is an identifier for each unique uh, 16S sequence that was found in the RRNDB database, that database of all of the 16S copies in all of the genomes that have been sequenced. We have a column for the genome identifier, the accession number for the genome. And then we have a count for the number of times each uh, ASV was found in each genome. Now, what we're going to do is if we do FL, we can use the pipe character, which we saw in the last episode, and we've seen in other episodes. If you've been a loyal watcher way back to the original episodes of Code Club, you've seen me use this pipe. And really what this is doing is it's directing the flow of data through my pipeline. Okay. So what I'm going to start by doing is let's group our data by the genome, because what I'd like to find out is how many copies of the 16S RNA gene occur in each genome. And what we can do is we could do group by, and we'll group by genome. And now if I run these two lines, the output that I get um, is basically the same as I had up above. And so if you notice, there's a subtle difference, and that's that there's this line now, groups, colon, genome. And it tells us that there's 15,389 genomes in our analysis. But otherwise, nothing has changed, right? Now, what I'd like to do is for each genome, I would then like to do summarize. Okay, so we're going to group by and then summarize. And I will then say n underscore rrns, uh, maybe just n rrn, so the number of rrn, and that's the operon that the 16s gene is in. And we'll say that is equal to the sum of count, right? And so you can see here that I've got um, the first nine rows in my data frame all come from the same genome. And that we've got these different um, ASVs. And so it's got nine ASVs um, and they're all different, right? So this is kind of like a worst case scenario, if you will, for ASVs. Um, and so if we wanted to add these together, we would use sum, the sum function, which takes a a uh, vector of numbers, a series of numbers, and adds them together. Um, and so we'll go ahead and run that. And again, what we find is that initial genome name we had uh, had nine copies. And that we see that some have one, six, four, five, seven, twelve, right? And so we see a wide variety of um, numbers of copies in there. 
we could also say pipe this into ggplot. So ggplot, and we could then say AES, and on the X axis, I'm gonna put NRRN, and I'm gonna use geom histogram, and this will then make a histogram for me um, that you can see in the bottom right corner here. Um, and, and that looks a little bit messy. Uh, so maybe what I'll do instead would be say bin width equals one. And, and maybe we get, um, we kind of get like a bimodal distribution, don't we? That we kind of have a peak at about uh, four. And then we also have a peak at about seven or eight. Um, and there's one that's way out here at 21. So we see that most of um, the genomes actually have more than one copy of the 16S RNA gene in them. And we'll talk more about ggplot in future episodes, but I just wanted to give a, a quick um, illustration of what that distribution looks like. Okay, so that was the first question we had, right? Which was, um, how many RN copies are in each genome? So something that I'm seeing in my output here is that summarize is ungrouping the output. And so we can override this with the dot groups argument. So if we do question mark summarize, and you can write summarize with a S or with a Z, uh, I believe the S is the New Zealand or the UK uh, spelling, uh, that if we look at the groups argument, we see that this is an experimental part of the life cycle, and that what we can do is drop. Uh, so if we say groups equals drop, then we will remove all levels of grouping. And what we can do is up here in our summarize line, we could do dot groups, equals quote drop. And if we run that, we see that that information message um, is removed. Now, what we might like to do is to know what fraction of genomes only have one copy. Well, we can repeat these first three lines here and we can actually group by the number of copies, right? So we can group by the number of copies and we can then say um, summarize and we could then say n uh, genomes equals, and we could use the n function, and that's going to count the number of genomes that have each number of copy, right? And so what you'll see here then in this output is that there were 1,566 genomes that only had one copy, 1,740 that had two, and so forth, right? So I think the most common is 2,671 with seven copies. And if I was a betting man, I bet <laughs> that there's a lot of E. coli genomes in the database and E. coli has, I think about seven copies in its genome. Now we could add a little bit of interpretation to this by using a function called mutate, which will add a column to our data frame. And so we could then say um, fraction, right? And so we'll create a column called fraction which will be n genomes divided by the sum of n genomes, right? And so these helper functions like sum, we can use in many different contexts. And so what we're doing is we're creating um, a column called fraction, which is going to be the number of genomes in each class, in each number of RN copies, and then dividing that by the total number of genomes. And again, up here for summarize, I wanna do dot groups equals drop to get rid of that message. And what we find is that about 10% of the genomes um, have only one copy. And as we saw before, about 17% of the genomes have uh, seven copies of the 16S RNA gene, okay? So again, this was the initial question we posed. We can think about things in a tabular format like we generated here, or as a histogram like we had uh, to the right. So the next question I want to take on is, what is the number of ASVs per genome? Okay. And again, the, the workflow is going to be very similar. So we'll do FL, and we're going to pipe that to a group by. And again, I'm going to group by genome. And I'm going to use my summarize function to then say um, NASVs or NASV, and that's gonna be equal to uh, the number of rows. So we'll use the N. So sum adds up a column, um, whereas 
uh, n will give you return the number of rows and n doesn't take any arguments. And again, if we run this, we find that that initial genome that we saw before um, had nine different had nine copies and has nine different ASVs in it, right? Um, and so we might like to know, well, um, that's the number of ASVs, but what's also the number of copies? So we might want to know n r r n, and we saw this up above as the sum of count, right? So we're kind of ex combining uh, both workflows here. And again, we'll do dot groups equals drop. And what we'll see is all of our genomes in the first column, the number of ASVs in each of those, and then the number of uh, total copies of the 16S gene in their genome. Maybe what I'd like to do is go another step here, similar to what we did with counting uh, the number of copies per genome. And I can again do group by um, n as uh, n RRN, and I want to know what is the median number of ASVs for that number of uh, uh, 16S copies, right? So I can do summarize, and I can then say mead n ASV, and that will be median n ASV, okay? And this then again gives me all of uh, the number of RRNs and then the median number of ASVs. So we see that the median number uh, of ASVs, if you have three copies in your genome, is one. If you have seven, the median number is five, actually, for full-length sequences. Uh, perhaps we'd also like to get uh, the, the quartiles. So what we could do would be L, uh, Q, uh, N, ASV. So for the lower quartile, and we can use the um, quantile function on NASV, and we can say prob equals 0 0.25. This will give us the 25th percent confidence interval. And then we can do the upper quartile on NASVs, quantile again, NASV prob equals 0 0.75. I feel like we, we kind of did this type of work before uh, when we were talking about weather data in, in a much earlier episode. And so again, we can see the interquartile range, the median value, and so we see that if we have seven copies, that 50% um, that of the genomes in our database have between three and six ASVs in them if there are seven copies of the 16S RNA gene in it. Again, this is a tabular output. What I could do is I can copy uh, these three lines here, if I can get my highlighting right, and I can pipe this again to ggplot, AES, and I can say X is the um, number of RN copies, Y could be the number of ASVs, and I'm going to send this to Geome Smooth. Uh, we talked about using Geome Smooth previously when we were plotting the uh, LAM price data, and I can use method equals quote LM. And so if we plot this, what we get is a straight line, as we might expect, between the number of copies and the number of ASVs. Um, and that it rises such that at about uh, 50, if you have 15 copies of the 16S gene, then you're gonna have about, on average, uh, 10 ASVs in your genome. And so it rises at a slope of about two thirds, you might say, okay? So again, as you have more copies of the 16S gene in your genome, you're more likely to have more ASVs per genome. Um, whether or not this is a good thing, uh, we'll revisit as we go through the analysis. Okay, so that was what is the number of ASVs per genome? And the final question that I was interested in is um, how many genomes does each ASV appear in? Okay, so we've been grouping by genome. What we're going to do then is to group by um, ASV, right? And so we're gonna group by the ASV, and what I wanna know for each ASV then is how many genomes are represented for each ASV. And so I can do summarize, and I can then say N uh, genomes, and that will then be N, uh, because that will tell us each for each of our ASVs how many genomes did it appear in? And again, we see that there's some where an ASV shows up in three, 
different genomes, one, two, three. So if we want to count the number of times uh, ASVs show up across different genomes, we could then pipe that to the count function. And then we can then count n genomes. And this will count the number of times an ASV shows up in three genomes, or two, or one, or seven, or, or however many. And we run this, and we find that there is, in general, um, an ASV is found in one genome, right? Um, again, one genome might have multiple ASVs, but if it has that G if it has that ASV, that ASV tends to be unique for that genome. Um, and so, to get a sense of what percentage or what fraction of all ASVs this is represented by, we can come back and again do a mutate to get a fraction, and then do n uh, divided by sum of n. And again, what we find is that 82% of the ASVs are unique to a given genome. Um, but again, what we found, kind of as shown by the plot over here on the right, is that a genome, as it has more uh, copies of the 6 s gene, will have more ASVs. All right. So again, um, this is a kind of a quick exploratory analysis that we have done. And... Um, I, I guess what I'm noticing up here is that I can refactor this code a little bit. Um, so if I were to run this again, um, you'll recall that this gave us output very similar to what we had before. Uh, so perhaps instead of group by and summarize, what I could then instead do would be to do count n r r n, and this will give us very much the same type of output again. So the number of RNs and how many genomes that is. Uh, and so here I'm going to change n genomes to n, right? Again, we get the same output, but with a slightly different approach. That count is a special case where if you're doing group by and then using summarize with the n function, uh, you can replace that with the count function on the column that you would normally be grouping by, okay? Again, both approaches work. Uh, the count is a little bit more concise. All right, so this is the V, the sorry, the full length data. Uh, I hinted that maybe we'll go ahead and try this with uh, the V4 data. So how about with the V4 data? Okay. So instead of full length, I'll call this uh, V4, and I'm going to replace that V19 with a four and read that in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to two of the analyses that we did. Uh, this first one that I just refactored, where we're looking at um, how many uh, copies um, of, well, this isn't going to change, right? So how many co RN copies in a genome? That doesn't vary whether it's full length or, um, or a re subregion. Um, but this question of, um, of uh, these two steps. Sorry, my mouse got a little bit silly there. Um, I'm going to copy this down, and instead of FL, we'll do V4. And what this again tells us is as we increase the number of RRN copies, how many ASVs are we going to have? And again, if we run this, we get a tabular view. And if we had um, seven copies of the 16S gene, uh, in a genome, then we're very likely to only have one or maybe two copies, um, one or two ASVs in that genome. So again, the V4 region has a lot less information and isn't going to discriminate across um, copies of the 16S gene in the same way that like a full length gene would. If we plot this, we would then expect the slope to be considerably flatter. And so what we find um, is that uh, for 10 copies, of the 16S gene that we would expect there to be maybe about one and three quarters, one to two, um, cop, one, one to two different ASVs in the genome. Um, and so a subtle difference that we might notice here is that these data in the table are the medians and over here is the mean. And we could, you know, perhaps think about um, changing this. So instead of median, maybe we do mean. Um, and that we would see then that for seven copies, we'd expect 
about one and a half ASVs per genome, okay? Which is basically what we see um, over here, right? Okay, um, so that's looking at the number of ASVs per uh, number of copies in the genome. Let's go ahead and ask about how many genomes each V4 ASV appears in. I suspect that because there's less variation in the V4 region relative to the full length gene, that we'll be more likely to see the same ASV in multiple genomes. So you'll recall that 82% of um, the full length ASVs were unique to each given genome. Let's see what it is for the V4 region. So what do you think it's going to be? What percentage? Well, what we find is that it actually goes down to about 76%, right? So of um, those ASVs that we observe, 76% of them are unique to a specific uh, genome. And we could, again, think about other variable regions within the 16S gene. Um, and something we also might think about is that this, again, is looking at the specificity um, of an ASV for a given genome. We might then say, well, what about if we look at the species level or the genus level? Or what if we kind of expand the definition? What we're talking about here are exact sequence variants, but as implemented in a lot of software doing Amplicon sequence variants, they actually allow for a little bit of slop in their definition of an Amplicon sequence variant, so they might need to entertain one or two nucleotide differences. So what I want to tell you is that we are going to get to those questions, but this general approach of group by and summarize will be seen later when we say group by a species or group by a genus and count the number of ASVs or look to see um, how many species um, does each ASV appear in, right? So does an ASV appear across multiple species or is it unique to a given species, right? And then again, as we expand the definition of what an ASV is to allow some more wiggle room and variation, um, what then also happens to the sensitivity and specificity of those Amplicon sequence variants? Um, and again, as I mentioned, um, there are some taxa like E. coli that have maybe a thousand genomes represented in this database. And so uh, we'll also want to correct for the inflated number of genomes and inflated representation that we see uh, in the database. Okay. So uh, don't forget to like and subscribe the video and to go ahead and uh, click on the bell so you know when uh, the next video drops and to tell your friends about what we're doing here in these uh, Code, Cloud, Cloud, Code Club episodes. Um, also, I would love to hear what you're doing uh, to analyze the data using the material that I'm covering in these episodes. Go ahead and put them in the comments down below. Um, if you have questions about what we're doing or have ideas for where we might take the project going forward, go ahead and leave those comments as well. For now, I'm going to go ahead and save this R script and quit out of R Studio, and I'll say goodbye and see you on the next episode of Code Club.